Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. All right, welcome to the Lights Out podcast. And this is more of the podcast slash interview section of it. You know, we get to have a lot of good people on here. I've had some, some exciting people we've been able to interview. This is a great one. This is a throwback. I thought I was an old school fighter, and I am. I really am. I haven't fought in a long time. I fought in like UFC 28 or 29. We're going all the way back to UFC 6, Six. 7, 8. Unreal. This is unreal. This is history. This is the polar bear we got. Mike Miguel, what do we got going on for this? Man, the polar bear, Paul Varlins, you know, uh, people that watched the early UFCs, I think he was a fixture. You know, the big giant guy and, uh, you know, always fought with heart. And, you know, I, getting interviewed him is, you know, kind of nerdy of us, you know, and I think Mike, you know, we, we, we dig that. Mike brings it up, you know. But to me, I kind of had that feeling of like, you know, the old boxer guys always seem bitter. You know what I mean? It's like I, we went to the Hall of Fame and you couldn't even go near Marvin Hagler. You know what I mean? No. He, was like, he had like an entourage around him, and he's, he's still bitter about the Sugar Ray Leonard loss. And the fact, <laughs> I, I understand it, but, you know, in boxing, you know, with tragedies and, and stories, and with some of the beatings Paul said, you know, I was worried if he was still going to have it up here. Well, this man, he still has it up here, and he wasn't bitter at all. So I found it to be a fun interview, man. We got to go over, like, a bunch of old topics and stuff, and, you know, he, he knocked it out of the ballpark a couple of times. Yeah, I thought, he, I thought he was real coherent. You know, um, I, first off, I'm doing sales. I'm in the middle of Ohio, and I'm like, it's Paul Varlins. Now, your average person would be like, yeah, it's Paul Varlins, okay. You know, if you're in the middle of nowhere, just, you know, maybe next interview, show up. Man, for somebody like Paul Varlins, I get, like, super nerdy about it. Like, oh, my God, I got questions. And um, I think we got a UFC trivia question out of it when we asked – who was this female corner, which was Becky Levi in UFC 6 against Tank, um, I, she may have been the first female corner in the UFC. Oh, she I may don't know. I, I, was, was, wasn't Phyllis Lee, wasn't she Dan Severance? I, or at least she was up there banging on the fence at some point. I thought she had to be a corner. Maybe not. I, I think know. she walked out with them, but I was told that she <laughs> was, you know, told to get away get out. at some point. <laughs> Well, she, she uh, occupied but, a lot of space with her walker sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, come on, that's an old man. Hey, hey, hey. Come on. It's, it's a legend right there. No, you know, and, and, uh, how, much, how much more respect can you have for somebody than that they go to corner you with a walker? They're not like, I'm done. <laughs> they, they're out there with you, man. That's a, I love that woman, man. Don't get me yeah. wrong. On the cage. Get it's him, a man. weapon. Yeah, it's a weapon at some point. You know, yeah, and nothing, I might add, nothing good about Paul that I really liked was he has the same mentality about a lot of this that I do. Um, he, he, he appreciates the people who came to fight and still do. He, that's what he loved. One thing he loved about the female fights because they come to fight hard all the time. They're not trying to win an athletic contest. They're, they're here to throw down. And, and that's what he loved about fighting. That's how he was. He fought with all heart. And, and, and I really cool. love that aspect about what he had to say. Yep. So, so that's it, well, brother. Yeah, well, Enjoy, further, right? Yeah, without further ado, we bring you here at the Lights Out Podcast, Paul Varland. Chris, you are on. Okay, everybody, back here at the Lights Out Podcast. Um, I consider myself an old school veteran of the sport, uh, but we're going back past that. I, I'm a young guy compared <laughs> to this. I, I mean, I'm the new guy compared to this. is a guy who's in UFC 6. UFC 7, UFC 8. If you're a fan of the sport, you know who I'm talking about. It's Paul Bar the Polar Bear. Paul, how you doing, bub? Doing good, doing good. Holding strong. As, right, as, 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 as my air is dropping, I'm getting all these drop-offs, I'm still holding in there. I can't believe I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said, it's hard for me to find somebody who's more old school than me. That is this, what we have right now. One thing I was wondering when I watched some of your old fights, um, you come out as a trap martial artist, I believe that's what it was. What the hell trap is that? Fighter. What, <laughs> trap fighter. I, I'm it was, confused. I it was a hybridized, hybridized mixed martial art. It, trap fighting was a school I was going to that allowed for me to enter into doing the UFC because if I was associated with any reputable martial arts school, they would have never allowed me to do the UFC because I had so little experience 
so little background. But I mean, I knew I could do it because of who I am and, and all the all my experience from, you know, just fighting on the street. You know what I mean? I never fought lit. I never fought one guy. I can't remember. The only time I fought <laughs> one guy was was in the octagon. So, <laughs> so how, how did you how did you wind up in the UFC then? How, how did that come to fruition? You know, it's it's funny, man. It's funny. I mean, there's different. You know, we can go through all kinds, but how it really broke down was this: is is I was doing martial arts at the school just for for to do something, do something different. I was, you know, in a weird place in my life, and I saw the UFC UFC four or five. I think it was four, or no, it was five because I only had six months to train. It was my first UFC. And I, I saw it and I was drinking beers with one of my buddies I played football with at San Jose State. <laughs> and, I, and I said, I could do that. He goes, No, you couldn't. And I made him a $5 bet. I said, well, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and I went to that little, that little martial arts school, the trap fighting school, and I told him I saw this thing called the UFC. He said, Yeah, we know. We saw it. It's crazy. I said, I want to do it. But I meant in like a year. I meant like, you know, I needed a year to train, right? So I didn't think for a second that these guys would go ahead and do what they did. I told them on a Friday I wanted to do it, but I guess I wasn't clear about the time frame. They got a hold of the, they got a hold of the people of the UFC over the weekend taught and, and just lied their asses off about my credentials. And, and, That's and a good move. they got me in. I showed, up move. The, I, sh- I showed up to the to the little school on on that Monday, and they're like, "Dude, dude, we got you in." And I'm like, "Are you are you kidding me?" No, no. Here they're gonna be sent the contracts. Everything's there. I was like, "Man, I was gonna train for like a year, you know." You know. You know what I, I love and, about you know what I love uh, about this story is the UFC didn't even take the time to investigate. They just took everybody's no. <laughs> word on. Oh, hey, hey, you got that five dollars. That's all that matters. Hey, you know what? Yeah, I got that five dollars. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what the secret is. You're right. They're right. The UFC wanted five guys, or, or I'm sorry, they wanted six or seven guys who really looked good as fighters. Looked good as fighters, but they didn't have to be good as fighters because they had one guy they wanted to win. Yep, yep. Was, there was the guy who they wanted to win, and then there was all the dudes who were supposed to look good losing. Okay. Yep. And and I happened to be a guy who who, who actually won. <laughs> they couldn't shake me because I was I was <laughs> even when I went down, nobody was nobody was destroying me. I never, you know, I never. If you if, back in the day, and it's still I think to to a bit the truth now, because you don't have to be undefeated to be an MMA guy here nowadays to have a successful career. If you show up, put the work in, give it all you got, don't get punked. People want to see you again. Yeah, people true. want to see you again. If you come in there and you you bitch out, you oh god, you just get well overwhelmed. And nobody wants to see that. Nobody wants to see somebody you. But if you do, and if you go in there, hold your own. You got a career. You know what um, was great is that's exactly how it used to be more in Japan when you fought, you know, Pride, Pancras. You go in there oh, and yeah. you fight your ass off. People loved it. You know, yeah. it's changed here yeah. in America a little bit, but it used to be just what you're talking yeah. about. That was 100. It's still the same over there, but we had that. You're right. The UFC was like that back early. It has, it's, it's evolved out of that, which I think sucks. I love the Japan and the old UFC style. Yeah. So, no, it, Paul, let me ask you, let, yeah. they, get, they get right into it a little bit. And uh, yeah. if you missed something, we could go back. But so UFC 6. You show up, and you got your you gym bag. Your drawers can't <laughs> work. Bag. Yeah, I got my gym bag. I, you know, we got guys who got whole teams of individuals with them, and even back then, they had some had trainers and they had their schools and all this. I showed up with my. I was like a hired gun. I showed up. I'm like, yeah, they point me towards it. Actually, my first time, I took the the, the trap fighting school with me, but that was the last time I did that, and that was pretty much the last time I was associated with him because when Tank. These little kids are in my dressing room with me, and when they had the monitors in, in your dressing room so you can know when to get ready, when Tank knocked out that Hawaiian guy and he did, like, the bug thing with his hands yeah. in the air and everything, you know, my, the little kids in my, oh, my God, Tank killed him, Tank killed him. I'm like, <laughs> if you don't get the fuck out of my dressing room right now, <laughs> that's my opponent I got to fight right yeah. there. I don't need your punk-ass shit right now running around in here getting in my fucking head. Like, oh, sorry. And I was like... <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's about the last time I'm taking some idiots. So, yeah, that's not an optimal corner job. But now let's take us through the day here because, first of all, Worsham, at the end of the day, we got very little, uh, you know, 
body of work to go on, but Warsham was already a UFC veteran, so that, that's I think a cool yeah. been the favorite the guy, right? If they, gave, if they gave odds, she would have been the favorite in that fight. Well, I mean, I, you know, as a fighter, you always have your odds for you. I mean, you can't yeah. be a fighter and think you're going to get beat. I mean, you really, I mean, at, at, at least at least how I see it. I mean, if you are a game fighter, I'm an, I'm an old man. I still think I'll beat the shit out of these guys now. I still, I'm, I'm more dangerous now than I ever was then because I used to worry about people. Now I'm too fat and out of shape to take it easy on anybody. <laughs> I'm going to rip your nuts off and shove them down your throat. And I'm capable of it. Well, I, 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 was, I was trying to tell these guys the same thing. As a good fighter, you have to be delusional to the fact you get your ass knocked out and think, nobody can beat me in the world right now. Nobody can beat, I can yeah. beat everybody in the world. That's what we have to do to be a good fighter. Right you, you know what? For, for first round, oh, dislocated finger, broken thumb. Yeah, okay, I'm going back and fighting. Yeah. Uh, separated rib, yeah, I'm going back and fighting. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's no the, bullshit. That's, well, that's what you, that's the commitment level you have to have to be a champion. And then so, to Paul, fight a tournament, you know. So, Paul, in your fight against Tank Abbott, I think you came out in a Gracie train, so you were well prepared, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> leading up to the cage. But you also had a female in your corner. Who, who was that? If I remember correctly, that's probably Becky Levi. That was. Oh, that was. I, just, a, I remember her. Yeah, I think yeah. Because yeah. Becky was hanging seven. out with with Ken with with Ken's group. And I was friendly with, not Ken, I'm sorry, with, with uh, Severin. Dan, Severin. Um, Dan Severin. Yeah, Dan Severin and Becky were real tight. And um, I was actually, I was at Becky's first fight in Japan. I was at the first female MMA fight when Becky had her fight in, in, in Japan. I think that was with Kingdom, I think. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, that, I think that was Becky. I mean, that, that was, okay, that, that was... Yeah, I, they would put you in a train. They throw people together from other groups, so you just come out as a group. That doesn't mean I was really I never trained with these people. Okay? Like that was that was they would just throw. You just met at the entrance, okay. okay? No, absolutely. And I mean, you know, some of the things you had to face as a fighter then too was the SCG was the promotion group at the time. They didn't know how to put out a sporting event. They knew how to put on concerts. So you had to walk through smoke that you shouldn't be walking through. Had to walk <laughs> over cables that you could trip over. I live in, 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 Uf in UFC eight, where where Puerto Rico. I think it was Puerto Rico. I sprained my ankle going back because all the Puerto Ricans were throwing fucking ice and cans, and it was a fucking <laughs> madhouse. It was a fucking madhouse, and I slipped on the thing of ice and sprained my ankle. I was still gonna fucking fight. They wouldn't let me. The doctors wouldn't let me. And that was some bullshit because at the time we didn't have those rules. They would throw rules out to get in the way of people if things weren't going the way they wanted to go. And yeah. they were pissed off at me in Puerto Rico because I took out their number one guy right away, which was Joe Morera. Joe yeah. Morera was supposed to be the next Gracie. And I took him out in the first round. They thought he was going to handle me. I took <laughs> him out. Now all of a sudden, no, shit, the polar bear might win a fucking UFC. And I, I, and I tell you what, I could have fought off my back. I don't care about the spring April. I would have fought off my fucking back like the Gracie's fucking doing. I mean, it wasn't it's not that fucking hard to manage a fighter. I think they wouldn't let me. It's they wouldn't let me. With with the tank fight, they stopped my fight. There at the time there was no stopping fights. It was knockout or submission. They were always fucking with my the rules on me, like always doing shit because they didn't they had guys they wanted to win, they had the guys they didn't want to win. And it was kind of it was fun fucking with their plans. And I'll tell you what, UFC 7, <laughs> which was I fucked them hard. Or at least they imagined I fucked them hard because their egos are crazy. <laughs> no, let me, let, let's get a little bit back to the conversation. You mentioned going yeah. into a fight. Okay. We talked in the prep about how people don't understand really about the old days. So now, Worsham, I was talking about how he was a veteran. He's yeah. a rugged dude, man. You know, so no, no, you he's, want, bad. You, he's a badass. You he had a walk. Uh, yeah, yep. he uh, you, man, yeah. may he rest in peace. Let me ask you. Yeah. Hey, did you walk into the tank fight banged up? Because your your face was marked up a little bit. And did oh, you have a broken yeah. finger? Were, were you fucked up? Yeah, I, you, dude, you're always fucked up. There was always something. Like I, I, w I would have sprained fingers, separated fingers, pulled ribs. You were, you were, you were, you were back. It's fight, man. You fought. It was a fight. Paul, there was no, Paul, you know, and, and yeah, I had, a, I had swelling. 
the size of a grapefruit on the size of my on the side of my face after after the it was yeah the tank fight when they, when they stopped the fight. Yeah, you got and, a pumpkin head. Yeah, yeah, and and you know it's funny. Uh, uh, Entertainment Tonight had interviewed me, and they thought they were gonna come. They were gonna do the the follow up interview, thinking I was gonna be like, oh, this sucks, I lost. And the guy stuck his microphone in my face like it was an erection. And he was all just stuck right in my face. And I, and I looked up and I smiled and I said, I had the greatest time of my life. That was awesome. <laughs> and the guy's microphone dropped like his, he lost his erection. It was like, <laughs> I, was I, wish, I wish I still had that interview. It was fucking money, man. He, just, <laughs> boom. I was, he wasn't ready for that. Now, Paul, to, to your point there, a lot of people don't understand, especially newer fans, People used to fight multiple times in one night. I did many times. We had eight man three tournament, times, whatever. Man. I mean, yeah, three times a night. At, at the end of it, it's not even who's the best fighter. Sometimes it's who can maintain their, you know, not get hurt as much. It's like the battle of that's, attrition sometimes. But that's, that's what all makes part of it. the best fighter. That's what makes yeah. it doesn't make a best. Be just because you go and you kick somebody's ass doesn't make you a great fighter. What makes a great fighter is when you got cornered. When you got when you start taking them. You weathered that. You made it through yeah. that weathering, and then you climb back on top. You came back on top. That's a badass fighter. Anybody can walk in and beat the shit out of somebody. Anybody can just be catch them, catch them, be faster, be be quicker. Da 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 da. da. But the, the 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 metal in a man is how he weathers the storm. It comes out hundred percent. Because so because that storm's coming. If you yeah, it's good, that yeah. storm, it's coming. And if you yeah. if you can't make it through, it's your ticket's punched already. It's just a matter of time. It's you, just you a know, matter of time. You know, Paul, one thing I look at it now, and I, keep, I always try to explain this to people, um, when, when I started fighting back when you were fighting, it was a fight, and nowadays it is an athletic contest. You know, a lot of people, it's right. not necessarily a fight anymore. Like, it's not about the toughest guy. It's about who's the best well-trained athlete. And that's kind of something's been lost. That's why I, I switched over to – I do commentary for the bare knuckle box, bare knuckle fighting, but I mean, yeah, uh, like we I'm used to do, this. like we used to do. Yeah, you know, that's exactly. how we did it. Yeah. And, so, and so, you know what? I'll tell you what. I, I just have one counter to you. There is some fighting left in MMA, and it's the women. The women fucking fight. The yeah, women you're right. fucking fight. And I and I throw, I'm throwing the gauntlet down to the guys out there. Guys, you're you're second place right now. You know All what? Right, There's I, some I, truth in that statement, man. Oh, yeah. There's some I'll, truth to this I'll, statement. I'll tell you the truth. We, we, you know, Jeff Osborne and Hook and Shoot get credit for the first all women show in American soil. They did it back, you know, in 2000, 2000, 2001, something like that. Anyway, the point is, is I was his matchmaker and I was sort of against the show after, before. I was like, man, you know, we don't have enough, you know, fights for the guys and, and this, that, and the other stuff. And then they showed up. Everything was. First of all, easy. You know, they all had medical exams. They all had pictures. They all had, like, you know, the promotional stuff yeah, that guys don't do. And then yeah. they all put on great fights. And all this, And then it was like, you know, uh, you just, I just gave up, you know. And it wasn't even like a give up. I, I admitted I was wrong. I just was wrong. You know, no, they, they were completely I mean, ready I about it. I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine back in the day that women could ever compete on the same level as men in sport anywhere. And I was wrong. I was wrong. because yeah. Because... They fucking do it. They do it. They do it hard. And they're not worried about their egos. Oh, what if I look bad? They get it. You don't look bad giving it your all. Winning and losing, you don't look bad giving it all up. Uh, so, okay. Paul, I, I, I get – we we get, like, issues with this show. Like, we like to get real, like, nerdy and kind of okay. Star wars <laughs> All right, so you fought Marco Huas, and you went almost like – I think you went past 15 minutes with him. Am I correct? Yeah. No, we went. Okay. We went nine. We went almost ten minutes. Nine Was it almost minutes. ten minutes? Okay. Almost ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. So, in essence, where do you learn jujitsu from, or de- jujitsu defense? Like the trap fighting school didn't work out, so <laughs> you start to evolve. Where does that come yeah. from? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. The funny thing is, I didn't need to know jujitsu as much as I needed to know Muay Thai that night. Okay. Like he came out with these Muay Thai kicks. And I, fuck, I had never even, I didn't even know that shit. And it's funny, <laughs> like at, I think four, Rough or training, man. In, four or five minutes into it, from the, that, 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 that kick, that low bow kick they use, that lower, that turns over, they break banana trees with it. Mm-hmm. Um, that hurts so fucking bad. <laughs> My leg on its own popped up and did the perfect, 
pot, knee 90 degrees, ankle down, boom, perfect block. And yeah. and I think Don the Dragon was in asking, he's like, hey, he knew the block. Why wasn't he using the block before? I didn't know the fucking block. My leg hurt. I didn't want it kicked anymore. I didn't even think of that block. My leg did it on its own. That was, <laughs> that's, that's, that's kinesiology right there. I'm telling yeah, you. As people fight, yeah, yeah. Is the is your body doing what it needs to do as most efficiently as it can? And that Muay Thai block and most all Muay Thai strikes are the most efficient form of striking there is and blocking. It, Muay Thai I mean, is efficiency in, in in destroying your opponent as far as I, I, I you know if you're gonna learn about Muay Thai in a fight, maybe Marco <laughs> Ruas is who you want to do it against. <laughs> oh, dude, no, I wouldn't recommend any way I did anything in my career to anybody else. I was I was designed for this shit, man. I'm I'm I can take a beating like a redheaded stepchild. That's why I knew I could do the UFC anyway. That was that was why I knew I could do the UFC. And my father was an ultra violent asshole who would try to kill me, and he couldn't. And because he couldn't kill me, I knew I could do the UFC. I remember Jesus. seeing going, you know what? If my dad could knock me out when I was three foot nothing and he was six foot five, 500 pounds, if he could knock me out, none of these guys could. That was the first thing that I realized. I said, holy shit, these guys can't hurt me. Like, <laughs> he really can't. And that's what I used. That's how I started. And I, like I said, I wouldn't recommend that to anybody, but it was a lot it of guys tell is. me. Yeah. Fighting me was like fighting Jason from Friday the Thirteenth. They throw <laughs> everything at me, and I just keep coming. Unless, <laughs> unless you break something, I couldn't use it anymore. Like what Mark Lewis did with my leg. Well, eventually, my leg just couldn't stand on it. I was just gonna keep coming. A couple, a couple little and, facts. I don't know if you remember the, uh, or if, if it was something you're aware. I watched that on pay per view, and you guys went over the pay per view limit. It, that that's fight cut story. off in like the last ten that's seconds. The story. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because. Once again, here's here's a little here's a little here's a little little backstage tidbit shit. UFC seven. I've got the flu. Sick as a dog. Sick as a dog. Green, sweating. They're like, oh, are you sure you want to do this event, Rollins? I'm like, I don't. I you know, what? Or what? What are you even asking me? So I'm having <laughs> grave fruit and garlic. I'm horribly ill, but I'm gonna do this fight. There's no way I'm not gonna do the fight. And the night before. I'm taking my grapefruit, my garlic inside, and Art Davies and Bob Marowitz and Marowitz heel, by the way, mm -hmm. um, super heel. He's my ultimate heel. Oh, so okay. they, <laughs> call, they, they call me over and they're like, "Hey, Varlins, we got things figured out. You want to hear it?" I'm like, "Okay, guys. You know, you want to insult me? Okay, go for it." So, so Marowitz says, "Yeah, we got you coming in like you know sixth place, which means I'm dog shit and, and I don't, don't have a chance." And I'm like, hey guys, wait, wait one second, wait one second here. I'm gonna be right back, okay? And they're like, what? And so I go up to my room. I used to carry this mini magic eight ball on my keychain with me. And you know, you shake it up and it answers the question, you know? Yeah. Remember those? Oh, oh yeah, 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 for yeah, sure. Okay, so I, I, I bring my little mini magic eight ball down to the, to the bar and I shake it and I go, how's Bronx gonna do in the, and, you know, how am I gonna do in the fight? And I look down at it, I don't believe anything. I just looked at him, I said, you guys are in for a big fucking surprise. And they're like, yeah, Varlins, whatever, whatever, okay. So I have a great UFC. I, I, I just tell myself I'm going to do the best I can. I stay cool-headed. I, I focus. And I tear through my first two opponents. And I'm in the finals against Mark Ruas. Well, in all of Bob Marowitz's wisdom, and, 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 and I don't want to be get you know, he's cheap, let's put it that way. He didn't buy enough cable time. Oh. So <laughs> at seven minutes. And in me and Mark Lewis's fight, half the cable companies pulled the cord. <laughs> and, and they had to they had to refund all those fucking people. Oh. And and Bob Marowitz wanted to believe that I was faking being sick, that it was my fault that he lost oh his God. ass on the show. And he, yeah, like our relationship sucked went to even worse after that point. But wow. you know what? Just because he was such a prick, I was like, yeah, after show, I'm like, yeah, I took your money, bitch. Sleep with that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm like, but you know, I mean, what are you gonna do? The guys, the guys insisting you're the bad guy anyway, so might as well enjoy it, right? <laughs> yeah. Enjoy it, bro. Yeah. Hey, uh, one thing there, I know you were you were fighting back in the, you know, you were you were there with the buffer uh, announcing, but maybe not the oh, same yeah. one people used to. <laughs> Tell us about that. Man, funny. there is, you know what? When I was as sick as I was, hearing Michael Buffer do that, oh, That's you ready to? 
I mean, it would reinvigorate him. You know, I think his brother does a great job, but not he's nowhere near. He ain't like Michael. His brother, yeah. his brother, his brother doesn't have to jump around and go. Ah! He does it with such style and finesse, class. and that slow buildup, that class of slow buildup. Yeah. There's nothing in the world like hearing your name said that way. And are you ready? Oh my god! Like it was, I couldn't believe it. that was probably one of the most surreal moments of my life. Realizing I'm having my name said by this man, and you know it was incredible. And we we went out in Wyoming. He was at the UFC six too. Uh, we went out in Wyoming and we're partying. We got him on video and I lost it. I wish I would have lost it. But we got him on video going, Are you ready to get laid? Like it was great. <laughs> <laughs> it was fucking awesome. He's a good guy. Great guy. In, in Wyoming, man. That's a good job, man. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, a lot of cattle uh, there. So, so <laughs> Myron Casper. Was- Casper was UFC 6, Casper, Wyoming. My, so, Myron gets the heel, the heel label. Now, you dealt with. Uh, some of the early promoters, uh, you know, that are now legendary and stuff like that. Talk about yeah. uh, fighting. See, this is the kind of thing that, you know, Paul says he had, you know, he doesn't recommend doing things his way here. Uh, you know, learning Muay Thai in a fight from Marco Ruas, uh, maybe not the best. How about fighting <laughs> Igor Vovchanchin in Russia? You know? Holy, <laughs> shit. Holy shit, that guy hit. That guy hit, he was like Popeye. He fucking was like Popeye. These big giant fists and these forearms he <laughs> just would jump up and fucking ring your bell. He was the closest to me being ever knocked out in my life was with him. He he was wow. unbelievably fucking he hit so fucking hard. Like it, I, I've never been knocked out in a fight. I was choked out by Dan, you know? But like I've never been so close to being knocked out. He, he, yeah, Igor was perfect just, hand placement. You got uh, perfect hand just, placement as well. He he just yeah, and he would just he'd get on a line with his punch. He'd yep. throw himself all behind it, all that he has. And there's a picture with him fighting another giant like me. I forget the guy's name was, and him knocking him out with a Superman punch. And he's literally <laughs> jumping up in the air. There's a picture of it. It's incredible. Um, yeah, he just hit so hard. I've never been. I've never been put in that place where the everything's going wavy, you know what I mean? Like, like that was, it was, yeah, he hit hard. It's the kind of thing where, like, for fans nowadays, you kind of got to go back and look at the Igor Vovchanchin archive. If you watch just the Pride stuff, now, that's amazing stuff, and the guy's a Hall of Famer, right? But for yeah. Pride, he operated as a heavyweight and put on a lot of weight. And by around the time you fought him, he was probably lean, 205 pounds. Yeah, and he you was, kill yeah, him. Just, that's the big or of chance that you fought. Yeah, he had fists like you wouldn't – like literally his fists were like – I think what he did is, you know, if you hit a Makawari board enough, you build up your bones in your hands. And I think he was working a Makawari board or something close to it and just toughening his bones and his hands. And you, you, when you hit a bone, you build a calluses. And you just hit it and you build a calluses. I think he must have calluses on every one of his fingers because he – I mean, on his bones because he just – damn, it was crazy. So yeah. How, how, I mean, how we- hit – I've been hit – my mom hit me in the head with a shovel. And did knock me out with a with a spade from behind. I mean, just wall. <laughs> it was a two stepper. I took two steps and told her to get lost before I forgot she was my mom. And so I've been hit hard. You know, I've I've been hit hard. And but that Igor uh, would get in, in my career a hardest hitter award for sure, for sure. All right, that's good to know now. Yeah, did, uh, did you grow up in a, like, did, did you grow up in Alaska or California? Yeah, yeah, I grew up in Fairbanks, Alaska, where the men are men and the skills are nervous. So <laughs> when uh, when did you move to the to to you know to California? I graduated high school in '88. I got a football scholarship to San Jose State University. Remember, we were 20th in the nation, best team they had. We won the California Raisin Bowl in 1990. Nice. Uh, one of the, the best teams San Jose State ever had. Uh, had some great games. Had some. We. I was. If you. If you're familiar with football, I was a part of the first team to use a thing called the punch shield diamond team, where three guys go in front of the punter. The punter kicks the ball. And everybody else releases. So you get coverage on the ball every time. Mm-hmm. And uh, Coach Shea designed that. And now they're they're they get gets used even in the pros now for the pro levels. That's cool. What position did you play? I was on the play? first team to do that. Huh? What I played offensive line and punt team. That special punt team. 
Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. So now I'm going to ask you because you got hit hard another time. But first, let's talk about Russia now. That was the IFC. Talk about how you hooked up with them, the promotion. And like I said, going to Russia, I think it was Kiev, right? So yeah, that was Kiev. That was, was it, Kiev. Was it oh, Ukraine God, or was it there. Russia? Now it's a beautiful place, right? But like it was I, Russia. It was Russia at the time, or it was, okay. uh, it was just before the wall fell. Just it was right wow. as the wall was about to fall. Wow. Like, you know, like right around that period of time. It was it was crazy, man, because like I every place I went, I learned something about the world and how culturally amazingly different things can be, how perspectives are different. Like in in Kiev and Russia, I found out what stoicism truly is. What, <laughs> what stoicism is suffering with a pride. Like your your suffering's part of your identity part of who you are and like we and when we follow overseas most of the time the money was mob money right so these guys in russia they're they're taking us around in bulletproof vans mercedes <laughs> benzes and they got machine guns i got i got two guys out on my balcony like it's a four inch balcony these guys are teetering in their big huge coats with their machine guns on my balcony i see these steam i look out and like hey guys you know, like, and I'm like, holy shit, do I need these many machine guns around me? I call <laughs> to the promoter, and he's like, oh, this is like, um, you're like, a, a, like, it's political. If anything happened, we'd be, it'd be horrible for us. So I mean, it's just protection. You're okay. And so I had a really good time there. They took really good care of me. They, they I had a better attitude than most of the fighters. Like, I ate the food, drank the vodka. You know, I, I didn't turn my nose up to different things. I enjoyed it. And so they took me different places and really – showed me their their city and, and, and all kinds of cool stuff. But the craziest thing was on my way home, I'm in a van full of guys with these Kalashnikovs. And I'm like, you know, hey, guys, I want to thank you for protecting me this whole time. And they're like, no. They all started laughing, like the biggest laugh you ever heard. And they're like, oh, you, you protect us. I'm like, what, <laughs> what, what? I don't, what do you mean? I'm like confused. And, and, they, and they go, oh, well, what a small, what a small family. We're not a big family. Not not a lot of you. Not not a lot of money. Not, we, we didn't bring in the other big families for this event. They're going to kill us when you leave. <laughs> the fighters gone. We're all dead. And they laughed and they're wow. yeah, we're going to take some out with us. And I mean, they weren't bullshit. <laughs> wow. man. They weren't world. bullshit. And I'm like, I yeah, the guy there quick. I'm, I'm sitting here with dead men. You know what I mean? Like these guys, are, <laughs> you know. But we're going to take some with us. And I'm just like. Wow, it, I like, think it, you know, I mean, it's just, just oh, like you know what I mean, like it's just different. I was, I had never experienced anything like that from America. You know? yeah. like, I've got a little experience in Russia, Paul. I, I, I actually was the matchmaker for Fedor and Matt Lindland that went down in Moscow, and I did about five shows there. One time, uh, I also went there as a corner for a fighter, and that particular time it was for Dave Strasser. We're in the back of the, uh, of the place, and uh, I walk into the what's our locker or the locker room, right? And there's, you know, tables and food. There's actually sushi, water bottles and stuff like that. And I'm like, all right, well, this, this is very nice. And they go to me, no, 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 the, the uh, guest uh, locker room is over there. Now, this was like a 70s ice hockey arena that we were in, right? Right. And we right, walked right, into right. a stone room. There was not a chair. <laughs> there was not a, nothing. No water, yeah. nothing. We got yeah. saved by the team of Spanish guys that had fought there before. And the dude had like a double long cooler bought. Had yeah. the whole yeah. team, but he knew what he was doing. Or else we were like, oh, shit, dick in the hand here. <laughs> well, one of the, you know, I, I actually ended up going to a, 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 a Kia hospital to get stitches. Because the night before, me and me and Boss Root were screwing around, and uh, he ended up t t throwing me through a, a glass a glass window, and uh, we're uh, drunk as shit. I I guess I bit him on the shoulder. I don't remember. We were <laughs> and so he throws me through this glass window, and like I think it was two stories up or something, and and it hit the hit the snow, and I got a piece of glass about the size of a. Of the end of a hockey stick sticking out of me. I'm like, oh, that's gonna need stitches. Oh and, man, <laughs> yeah, I had to, I had to go to this fucking hospital, and oh my god, I, I literally, it was like going back to the 1930s. I'm not the 30s, okay? Like it was this, this doctor with a chef boyardee hat comes at me with stitches that look like hockey strings, like literally hockey laces, and I was like, wow, the adventures continues. 
And, and that, that was before your fight? That was the night before the fight? No, that, no, 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 that was after. We're, I only okay, got okay. super drunk after the fight. Yeah, no, no, no. Okay. No, but well, I, did, I, did, I did fight with stitches going from Brazil to Amsterdam once. I had to, put, I had to cut the stitches out but super glue in the holes to fight the next, the next week. Now, go, you know, uh, you also uh, ran in, uh, down to Brazil for what, some of the early shows down there. Yeah, the Valley uh, Tudo. Yeah. And, and you got uh, you know, a promoter that, that comes to us with a, 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 a scary <laughs> reputation. That's old Federico Lapenda. Uh, yeah. You know, there was Bottarelli and Lapenda back in those days. And right. uh, I, I worked with Bottarelli. I judged his shows and stuff. So I never got to work with Lapenda, but he was uh, – he was an interesting cat. Yeah, he had a reputation. And, and yeah, he had a yeah, interesting he, reputation. You know, it's it's kind of funny. The universe just opens the doors for me and gives me gifts a lot. And I'm very lucky. And for one of my fights I had with, with Lapenda, I knew he wasn't giving me enough money, but I needed, I wanted to fight. I wanted to travel, but I knew there was more money. But he was always, oh, no, there's no more money, blah, 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 blah. So I'm at this, I think it was, I think it was, I think it was the, uh, I think not, not the pride show, not the, not the, not the, I did, I did everything. So it's kind of, uh, not kingdom. One of the Japanese shows don't come to me, but the promoter came to me and he had $10,000 in cash and he had this big smile on his face. Like he knew he was screwing Lapenda. He knew, he knew he was giving it to Lapenda up the ass. He walked up, he goes, Oh, here's your money. And I'm like, I was making three thousand for the show, I think, uh, and, oh. and it was ten thousand dollars there. And I'm like, "What? What?" And, and he's like, "Yeah, no, he goes, he goes uh, since Lapenda didn't come, he doesn't get his cut. So I'm giving it to you. You can, you can give him his cut." And he smiled at me. He, he, the guy didn't like Lapenda at all. Okay, so he smiled and said, "Here, you, you can give Lapenda his cut." I'm like, well, "Oh yeah, oh yeah, for sure, I will." And, and I got <laughs> on the phone. I got on the phone. And I said, hey, uh, I got our money. He goes, what? What? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, why don't you meet me at the airport? I'll give you that $7,000 you earned in my fight. <laughs> and, you know, hey, just come pick it up. Just come. I'll just mail it to you. No, no, I want you to come and take it from my hand. You earned it. <laughs> you earned it. Come and get it. <laughs> he didn't show up. Oh, don't yeah. be like that, man. Don't be like that. I'm like, be like what? Just come look me in the eye and take the money you earned. It's That's fair, cool. Right? That's unbelievable. It's no, fair, right? Like, that it's was the just... universe. Universe taking care of me. I swear to God. That's, good. Good. That's, good. That's a great attitude. Just for, for the record, Lapenda put him in with Mark Kerr. So just, I mean, so when, well, we're talking about hard hitters. Kerr's got to be second, though. You know... Yeah, well, I mean, dropping knees on you, you're going to – you should And headbutts. But, but I'll head tell you what, and... though. No, I never – in that fight with Kerr, I was never in the in – the, in, he wasn't going to knock me out. I was clear. I was tired. It hurt. You were but bloody. That like, that was the problem. Was, no, look. The, Kerr's knees were not as hard as Igor's punches. I'll tell you right now. Really? And he, he, Kerr jacked me up. Kerr jacked me up. And it was one of the best things that could happen for me because I – Reevaluated myself at that point. I said, okay, I'm not here to get this done to me. I either can step up my game, prepare myself to fight better, or get out of business. So I took, after the curve fight, it took uh, about two, three weeks and thought about it and doubled my commitment, tripled my commitment, dropped 90 pounds and, and came out. I was, by the time I was, by the time I was, you know, 290 I was 298 that's when I was fighting I did I had my last couple fights with uh with uh, uh Dick Burick in, in Brazil and then there was a fight there was another Lapenda fight in and and in uh Brazil but he he wanted he didn't he made it look like it wasn't his fight he said wanted me but he didn't want to deal with me at that point um <laughs> so yeah uh that was I was oh, dude, I was just really getting where I needed to be and that's when it went under that's when it got. That's when that, that douchebag, God bless his soul, uh, <laughs> used the used the fighting thing as a as a as a venue for him to run for his presidency the first time. Uh, the guy from Arizona, he got uh, yeah John McCain. All the yeah, John McCain stuff to kill this. Movie. God bless his political <laughs> asshole. You know, I'm not gonna talk bad about the man, but but you know he he he. he 
he was in the boxing commission. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about it, but the guy. Okay, so um, but that's you know the the sad thing was is I was so God, I'd gotten so much better physically. My skills were together, and it was just I was ready to really show what I could do. And then he got banned. Yeah. Damn. And <laughs> and then the worst the worst thing the worst thing was was they brought it back. And then they put a 268 pound, 265. I couldn't make that, and I did everything I could to make 298. And and I was lean. I was lean. I maybe I could have, but I didn't know how at the time. And basically, the sport when this I helped start got yanked out from underneath me. It was it was a ball breaker. That, that was the, you covered a couple of things I want to ask you. I, I wanted to ask you eventually if if 265 was within your limit, but I also want to give you some props because from the very first time we saw you, uh, you know, it, at UFC six through your career, I remember you, you you came back, you shaved your head, and you were a lot leaner, and definitely yeah, you took yeah. it definitely seriously. You know what I mean? Oh, so yeah. definitely props. I, I was learning on the job, bro. Like I, I literally, my first UFC, I had four months of training, four months of training, and I didn't. There was nobody to show me. What how did to you make? What there did was, you make? There on was that? nobody to show you. So what it was, was. It was. You know. What, we what did you? What, what did you make in your first UFC? Uh, like it was. It was. We got five grand to show, and then if you made it to the semis, it was ten grand, and then if you, you know, then it was all or nothing for fifty or or a hundred thousand depending on the show. Like I was in the ultimate Ooh. ultimates for a hundred that well, was a hundred thousand to win it. Um and uh yeah that was it was it was kind of funny to 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 keep going, you know, and, and I was making from three to five thousand at international fights, you know, and I was fight we fought a lot. Like you see guys talk about fighting once or twice a year, three times a year. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? I'm doing that a month. <laughs> that, that, that was a that was a small month three fights. You know, yeah. I'd pay the bills. And so, but, but it was great traveling. It was great. I mean, fuck, man, I, I wouldn't trade that period of time from life for a professional football career that was paid and all that, blah, blah, blah. Cause I, I got to experience the world in a, in a, in such a special way. And I also have this period of time where I, I think there'll be a resurgence where people will refigure what we were doing. I got the time period where it was the wild, wild west, man. It was the <laughs> wild, wild west. No rules, awesome. no gloves. It was All awesome. the stuff they're going back to you now. Yeah. We did it, and we we're doing it three times one night, and it was it was immense. You know, it was it was. You know, the guy would come into your the guy would keep coming into your into your into your dressing room, going, "Are you gonna fight again?" Like, listen, I told you I'm gonna fight. No, yeah, I'm gonna fight. Ten minutes later, are you gonna fight? Are you fight? The next guy that comes through that fucking thing asks me to fight, you're gonna be leaving on a stretcher, okay? Leave me the fuck alone. I gave you. I told him to be there, you know, because yeah. you, you know you, you there gets getting in your head, you know. Like no, I don't, it's not an option. I don't. I'm not, I'm not not gonna fight. You're gonna have to pull me out of out of this fucking thing dead for it, you know. And did, I mean, that's uh, probably not the smartest thing, but that's who it was. In the UFC, did someone besides McCarthy uh, ref your fights? Because the, the, back in the early days, I know Rich has. Uh, I'm sorry, I know. Mike here has a, a Rich Gogo Goins uh, fetish he wants to ask you about, but yeah, I, love, I, I like the yeah, G man. No, it was all it was all Big John. It was all Big John. He's a great guy. Like I said, when he stopped my fight with 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 Tank, I was pissed because the rules were a certain way at that time. But but he was genuinely worried about me. And after the fight, he goes, "Okay, I know what you're made of now. I would never do that again. That's that's cool, bro. No worries." And Tank would never rematch. Me. God, I want. Uh, all right, so so one of the qu one of the questions we always ask the old school guys is yeah. Mark Kerr versus Mark Coleman. Who do you think would have won that fight? Oh, well, <laughs> I think I think I think Coleman is smarter as far as a fighter. I think he's a smarter fighter. Like I think he would have found a way to get into Kerr's head because Kerr, honestly. He was an amazing athlete, an amazing specimen, but he was scared. All of what he was doing was building up of, because he was so scared. He was scared cool. to death. He was shooting all that juice because he was scared to death. So if, if, if he would have got cornered and got in trouble by Kerr, which Kerr could do, I mean, not Kerr, but Coleman could do, I would give it to Coleman. I would, definitely, I, I would give the mental edge to Coleman, and the mental edge is so important. 
that, you know what's funny is Coleman always just says, I was in his head. Who didn't ever beat me? I was in his yeah, head. Exactly. Exactly. Coleman's exactly. already gearing the fight. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Coleman's ready to do that right everything. now in the parking lot, you know. Coleman. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the mental we aspect of fighting is ninety-eight percent of it. Okay, yeah. like if you have the right mindset, you're gonna go very fucking far. If you let yourself down training, you're gonna fall short. But that's part of the. If you know and you're you're mentally together, you're gonna you're gonna do what it takes. You're gonna grow. You're gonna get better. Like I would say, the only reason why fucking uh, um, Ken Shamrock lost to fucking what's his face the 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 uh god i hate the guy um uh he was one of tank's little boys uh you know tito the only reason why the only reason why ken lost to tito is ken was in a camp where he was the top dog and nobody was telling him bro you gotta work mm -hmm. harder the only reason why he lost to tito is he didn't have anybody telling him bro come on step it up he should have been tito he should he had all the skills he had the experience but he was he was in an attaboy camp. All of the, all the young guys were telling him how great he is, telling him how fucking unbelievable he is. He needed somebody <laughs> going, bro, get to work, get to fucking work, bro. And he would have he would have he would have man him. But it, so he, uh, like, who are good form. who are some of your training partners that really pushed you in preparation for the UFC? I only had so many. Okay, number one, that was my number one weakness as a fighter was I couldn't find hardly anybody to train. But when I so did, says, I had some. I said I had some great guys, and it was it was it was Brian Johnson, who's a who's a specimen, tough, yep. tough, tough specimen of a man. Also, Legit. rest in peace. And yep. huh? Also, rest in yeah. peace. Right? Yep. Phenomenal. No, he's still being. alive. He's still alive. Brian's still alive. Did, he had did, a stroke. Oh, okay, okay. Well, he had yeah, my mistake, but he had a stroke. He's not quite dead yet. God, it's, it's not another one. Unless there's something I don't know. No, 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 uh, no. no, no. <laughs> I, you're you're right. He had he had a. a he had a stroke, yeah, he had a stroke um, too, so. Right. But he's, he's that, and I, I really think what a champion he is for working through that and coming as far as he's come, like, it's amazing what he, how he worked through that. That's an amazing thing. Um, and, but, but as far as training partners go, then there was Brewster, James Brewster Thompson, who's like one of the best judo guys in the nation. He, he's like the number two judo guy. When I got my first arm bar on him, he was so freaking strong when it took me 45 minutes to set my first key lock on him and get it and i it was like i won a ufc i jumped up and it was the <laughs> most amazing thing in my life um but without those two guys all i had was my mattress and my shadow because i was so fucking big that you know i i had to even when i was training with somebody i was going at 85 75 percent and that's not giving you your best look. That's not bringing out the best in you. You got to you fight like you train. And, and being the monster that I was, I just couldn't find bodies that could last. And even yeah. if they were tough, I couldn't go full on because I would hurt them. And then where was I? Yeah. So yeah, that, that was, was, you know, it's not easy being huge. Yeah. You know? with, so what, the big guys, with the, uh, really fast, Mike, with the big guy yeah. syndrome, you know, it, you just remind me a little bit of like, uh, Andre the Giant in pro wrestling, where like the other guys, when they had, when he was the opponent, they knew they could cut loose on him, and yeah. you know, and you really look better when you're going full. You know what I mean? And he could take you know, all. You know, now, and, you know, and now that you, you bring it back to pro wrestling, thing, I am so proud of my match I had with Taz <laughs> because I sold, I sold that shit pretty damn good. We rolled pretty good. We did, we did hardly any warm up for it. We, that was. That was pretty much a working together, knowing wrestling and knowing how to do some things. And we, we, we made that thing happen. And it looked good. It looked damn good. For as, yeah, for as green as I was. ECW? How, how was huh? your time at ECW? How was your time at ECW? Yeah, talk about the ECW promotion. You, 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 you gave me a little bit in the prep. Let's go ahead and, and – Yeah, yeah okay, yeah. Then. Well, you know, the, the, the Pauly Dangerously got a hold of me. Hey, man, we love you out here in ECW. And – you know, we want to, you know, once you come on out, throw some of our guys around, make some money, make some easy money. And, and you know, hey, I, I can't lose because I know, I know, we just want you to use your name, get, get you over in some small thing or things that maybe a big show down the road, whatever, we'll pay you. Yeah, pay me 500 bucks a spot and beat up the little guys, these little gigs. And the first thing that happened to me was there was, I, I walked into the first show and there's this little, little cute Asian crowd. I don't know what her name was at the time, but. That she's one of the pro wrestling managers, whatever. She likes me. Oh, I mean, like you. I'm like, oh wow, this is kind of hot. And then out <laughs> of fucking out of this crowd comes this monster, six foot one, blonde, 
big titted fucking looking babe, and she just shoved her hand in the little Asian girl's face. He's mine, and that was Missy Hyatt. And so Missy's like, "I like you. You're mine." I'm like, "Okay, upgrade, upgrade, cool." Yeah. And Missy Hyatt is a, is a fixture in ECW, so you you had yeah. you had like a foot in the door already. <laughs> no, absolutely. And you know, there, I, I think there was a few yeah, feet think, that, that wiped was, off on that door. I think the, the girls were a bit of a of a of an offer up to get me going at the show too, you know. Um and um, you know, but we ended up hanging out for a little bit and it was it was pretty cool. Um and she kind of talked shit in her book about me, but but you know what I kind of looked at it as as she was just a little bit a little bit bitter because she she I mean I had a lot of things going at the time. I wasn't doing anything seriously, right? And so one of the girls that I, that I was seeing kind of called up Polly. Polly kind of was a dick about it to let her know about it. And she ended up getting pissed off at me, but whatever. So like in her book, she, she talks shit like that I have a small dick. But I have her on YouTube talking about me having such a huge dick. So I'm like, okay, depending <laughs> on which, which, which time is she angry or not angry, she talked differently. Um, but I had, fun. I, I had fun with her. She was cool. Um, well, talk about and, dangerously because you know, he, he, he pulled uh, – he pulled a promoter game on you. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, I, you know, I, we were, I was very clear with him about I couldn't lose to anybody. And so he, <clears throat> I don't know what he's thinking, but he, he, he's having, he goes, I want to talk to you. We're, we, he pulls up the chairs in the middle of the locker room and all the other wrestlers around the outside of us, Blue Meaty and, and uh, all these guys, we're really good guys. Like I, I've made friends with them instantly. And Paulie's feel was, you're going to do us this favor. And I'm all, man, I already told you, I, could, I can't lose to a pro wrestling thing. I'm a fighter. You know, this, this ain't going to happen. And he goes, no, no, you're gonna, you don't have a choice. You're going to do this. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I was like almost busted out laughing. I'm like, he was, he was, implying, <laughs> he was implying this was going to be a forced situation. And I think he thought his guys were going to back him up. And I look out into each guy, and it's like a little circle around us. Like we're in the center of this little circle. <laughs> And each guy looked at their eyes hit the ground faster than my eyes could meet those. And that's the universal sign of submission. That's, I, I don't know what are you talking about, you know? And so by the time my eyes got back to Paulie's eyes, he realized he was all alone. He was in a room full of his guys, but he was all alone with the boulder. And I'm like, are you talking about Paul Heyman or Paulie Dangerously? Paulie Dangerously. Okay. Yeah. Same, isn't that same in the same is it same? No, no, Heyman, Heyman's a different guy. Heyman's been Brock Lesnar's manager, like the Mike guy on, on WWE. That's Heyman. Well, the, 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 there was the head promoter of ECW. Yeah, guy Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman. Okay, Paul Heyman. Sorry. I get yeah. that mixed up. No Not problem. Just, okay. Um, so, yeah, so my eyes come back to Heyman's, and I'm like, <laughs> so what were you saying? And he's like, oh, well, I, I'm about, I'm about to go, I should fucking shove you in my locker right there. And I, I picked him up and started walking him hanging to the thing. I'm like, I should leave you in the locker for the show. He's like, oh, no, 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 no. come on, I'll give you this, I'll give you that, I'll pay you this, I'll pay you that. So I put him down and and, and we worked out a thing for like, I think it was $5,000 for achievement. Like his, his uh, Taz's, Taz's uh, partner came out, did a drop kick off the top rope and I was supposed to be knocked out by the, by the, uh, drop kick or whatever and okay and to tell you the truth the, he was supposed to do the drop kick off my chest and he did it off my chin i think he was going for it and but Ooh. nothing he hit my chin and i was like what you know what i rolled over and okay whatever <laughs> and, and uh so yeah so we got he got the cheat win and, and i got my money and but that was kind of that soured our relationship i was yeah because you seem like the perfect guy for pro wrestling for like the you know you you know i tried to get into pro wrestling before the UFC. And I was up in the Bay Area where there was really no pro wrestling schools, pro wrestling contract, contacts. I wanted to pro wrestle. I totally wanted to pro wrestle. And I was going to go that way up until I saw the situation with Owen Hart. Ugh. When I saw basically Owen Hart get murdered by McMahon. Um, and continue the show afterward. I and, mean, you know, guy dropped to his death with, 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 and they forced him to do it. He didn't want to do it. It was equipment that he never used. It was shitty equipment. It was, it was fucking murder, man. It was manslaughter, whatever you want to call it. Man. But that's what it was. And I realized at that point that if I was in that situation, if I was Owen Hart, 
it would have been fucking McMahon hanging by that fucking wire. Yo, Shamrock was on that card. And, and yeah. I wouldn't fucking, yeah. I don't want to go to prison. I don't want to go to prison. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, Shamrock, so. Shamrock was two bouts after that. And I interviewed him and he said, yeah, we, we, we thought that was part of the show. Like they, they even <laughs> really? the locker room had no idea. Yeah. 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 I did an that's interview a, with him about I, it. I, that soured me on it. And, and maybe that was stupid, but I was really nervous. Honestly, I know myself. And if my career and everything was put online to say, do this or die, I would kill the other guy. Really would. Well. Really well, yeah. sorry, but, but that's just you know what I mean. You you want me to fucking kill myself? Well, let me help you along. I mean, I, I, <laughs> you know, like I, I get crazy in situations like that. So, so I just chose not to pursue it after that. I was like, no, oh, no, that's just you know, what, probably what, should have. But what, what about the time in Japan? Because you did you did a couple of Japan shows. Uh, you 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 did Pancrase one time. You you seem to be like Pancrase. like they brought you in as a hitman more than. Like somebody was gonna let you catch on. You you actually also did uh, that fight with Dick Vry in Holland. Uh, right, right. Ring, you right? know, here's the problem. There was fights being thrown, and in the Pancreation show, they were telling me you don't have to win to impress us to become part of our thing. You don't have to. They did, but they wouldn't come out and say it. They wouldn't just come out and say, "Hey, we pay so much, you do us the favor." Blah blah blah. And I'm I would have thought about it, but at the time. I didn't get there was play for pay going on. And so I was approaching it as a hundred percent fighter. And if I would have been a little bit more open and wise to what was going on, I probably could have got a lot more shows. I probably got have gotten into a couple of things, but I was, I was, you know, I, I almost won that pink racing show. It was a really good show. Like I, and that was awesome. The pink racing show was awesome because me and Yanni, I was, we had, he beat me by one point, like he did beat me by one point. And, what they were expecting me to do on that show was just to go ape shit, fight like a crazy fighter. But I respected the rules. I did the, I did, you know, I, I, I followed everything that's going on. And I actually went from being the fighters being cold to me to after that fight, everybody loved me. Everybody. And, and Yanni, they were trying to pump up his points and he stopped and said, no, that wasn't a point. And it was, it was such an incredible show. And what was funny is at the time, you, they'd light up the ring and you'd have 35, 45, I don't know, maybe 55,000 people in Thing. And they're all dead silent. Yeah, and you don't hear a pin drop. And there's all these people. And so I broke Yanni's nose with an open hand strike early in the fight. And he had about they were given like ten minutes to try to get the, the bleeding stop. And somebody out in the crowd goes, "Put him out!" And so I kind of waved where I thought he would be, and that section went crazy. <laughs> and so I did a I did a slow wave around the whole thing, and the whole place went on fire. <laughs> And that promoter hated it. That's not what they wanted. They wanted that silent, respectful mm. fucking thing. And Weird. so I think I, that may have soured my chance with Pinker. But it was a great guy. I had a good time. I had a really good time. Okay. So, so uh, Paul, we, we have a segment where Let me, we – You know uh, what? My, my ear thing just warned me low battery. And so I got to go change headphones real quick, okay? Okay. Is that okay? One yeah, second. Yeah, I won't yeah, take absolutely. one second. We got an editor. Go, we got an editor. Go dead on me. This thing will go dead on me. Uh, but yeah. Well, let's do the asshole segment, Miguel. Do you want to bring it in or? Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to figure out mathematically who is a better thief, Jamie Levine or uh, Frederico Lependa. Because Frederico Lependa was getting 70%. But. That's bad. Okay, but like, uh, uh, you know, 10,000, yeah. he was giving him three. What what Levine, Levine used and to he do. Did that he, to me. he did that to me maybe. Oh, I don't know, ten times. <laughs> oh God! Levine, Levine used to ask for five thousand from the sponsor, and they give the fighter yeah. five hundred. So that means <laughs> oh, five hundred oh. for him. So oh. he would just drop a zero. It's much easier that way. Actually, yeah. I guess I guess Levine's got to get the credit for the. Uh, well, I think the <laughs> the predatory criminal sex offense also may have uh, put it. Yeah, well, honestly, you're better at I, 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 you know what? I, I did my switch, so we're good now. Um, it, you know, I so wanted him to come get his money because I would have gave it to him plus a little extra, you know. <laughs> but because I'm not gonna steal from the man, all I had to do is come get it. All I had to do is come get it. He's gonna have to come earn it. it. Come earn it. Yeah. He, he would have earned his money. Yeah, he so. wasn't. He wasn't that kind of guy either. He he was more. No. Like, uh, the no. shoot, cowardly, cowardly type. So Mike was going to introduce a new segment where we're going to run through a list of names. Uh, I think at the beginning we hinted about it, and we'll go with 
We're gonna go with uh, uh, baby face or heel. And there you uh, go. Yeah, well, I like that. Better than yeah, asshole. Personal. We That's wanted personal. to do that. We wanted to do the asshole, but yeah. But Paul, Paul asked for baby face and heel, and it'll work out just fine like that. We'll just go through the list of names here and ask you. I'm gonna start off with John McCarthy. Oh, baby face. Cal Worsham. Hey. Uh, Cal wanted to be heel, but he's a baby face. He's a good guy. Okay. All right. I'm gonna go with. Uh, we'll go with. But well, we already know the answer with Frederico Lapenda, right? Oh, heel. Heel, heel, heel. <laughs> Such a heel. Okay. He needed a heel. He needed a heel badly. <laughs> what about my favorite early UFC fighter, Harold Howard? <laughs> Howard. I never got to meet him, but he he ran into his selling his the tough guy thing so hard that when he came down, he kind of baby faced himself. He was a wannabe heel that baby faced himself the way he went down. <laughs> so you were but you guys were on the same event though, right? No, 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 no. He was he was before him. No, he was, he was a little bit before me. I think he was maybe the one before me or two before me. Yeah. yeah. I love, I like his thing. Though. I like I like his thing though with the glasses and the, the he, he had a car that matched his outfit, by the way, too. He had like a Lincoln. Wow. <laughs> I got tell you, Art Davies. Yeah, Art Davies. Huh? How about Art oh, Davies? Baby face, big time. Good guy. Good, good, good guy. Dude. Fact, he, he came up to me. He says he doesn't remember this, but he came up to me and said, after I, you know, one I was runner up in UFC seven, and they talked all that shit. I, he came up to me and he said, "Um, could I maybe borrow that that uh, eight ball sometime?" <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's cool. Pretty, yeah. Uh, yeah. Art yeah. Davy, Art Davy played a trick on Joe Silva. Did you meet Joe Silva? Um. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, met him, but never, never. He was kind of an assistant back in those days, but yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You could drop him. And I'll tell you what our Davy did to him. Our Davy told him, "All right, uh, now you got to go into Don Fry's locker room and ask him for the belt back. We need it back." And you know, Don, <laughs> Don did what? And he sent him in there all by himself to try to do that, and Don didn't give him the belt back, and it was you know kind of a joke. But yeah, it, I, I it would, I would good. bet you, I would bet you the conversation went like this. Uh, we need the belt back, and you probably said, "Come get it." <laughs> yeah. All right. What about uh, what about Oleg Tektarov? Oh, Oleg was a great guy. Oleg was a great guy. Oleg was mad at me at first because he wanted to be the Russian bear, but the polar bear popped so big that he didn't really get in the Russian bear thing didn't pan out for him. So, <laughs> how about Kimo Lapaldo? Yes. Kimo was a good guy. Kimo Kimo's a good guy. Really good guy. We had a we had a really good fight. Um I was wore myself out hitting him. Wore wore myself out hitting him. Like we were both so gassed at the end of the fight. Like they said he he choked me by a side thing, but I just hit him till I was exhausted. Big John kept saying, if you don't stop hitting him, we're gonna get you to your feet. We're gonna get you to your feet. So I just get hit him and hit him. I was so tired I literally fell over. I'm exhausted. I, I was 400 pounds at that fight. I was at, at the only time I did steroids. My buddy stopped me to doing steroids. It was the dumbest thing I ever did because I got so goddamn big. I was too big. I was it was exhausting <laughs> trying to throw my own punches. So that was a one in time only for the steroids. All right. So in your in the locker room, uh, like one of the prelim fights of UFC six, there was He Man Ali Gibson. Okay. <laughs> Do you even remember him? I, you know what I. Only hung out with I think one of the prelim guys you've seen. He had a he had a big old like a big long um uh, what do you call it? mullet and like <laughs> hardly any teeth. Uh, but he was a nice guy. Like I, almost all these guys are really really good guys. The only guy who's was really pretty much seriously was an asshole was Tank. Like he was, I think he was playing a role, but but he was he was like from this whole. I'm a badass from Long Beach, and, da, 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 da. and he was—he was—it was never. It was always maybe he wasn't playing wrong. Maybe that was really who he was, and he was a douchebag. I wanted to put my hands on him again. I really did. I really. He talked. What about? What about the yeah. Dudley brothers? <laughs> the Dudley brothers are awesome. I love the Dudley brothers. Like, <laughs> well, they were great. They were—they were, were fun. They were fun. A big. Remember Blue Blue Meanie? Blue Meanie. Hell yeah. Good. Blue Meanie what, was awesome. What about Ken Shamrock? Was he a dick? Oh no, Ken was a great guy. I mean, Ken Ken was a really good guy. I mean, he was he was had the attitude of a fighter who, you know, he he was he it's weird when you get alphas in a room together. 
you, if you know when to respect each other's turn, it's all good. And that's how it worked with me and Ken. Is he knew when he, he he was an alpha of his area and space, and but I was definitely an alpha in my own way. Like you know, it's funny. His his brother Frank, before he fought, he had a like Ken had a jacuzzi in his in his room, and we were all in after the fight, and and his, his brother Frank gets in, and and he's all, hey, I'm the fight, I'm the fight, I'm here pretty soon, and I'm all. Dude, you're an underwear model, dude. He was, he was ripped. I mean, <laughs> I know. I mean, you're a fucking underwear model, dude. You're not gonna fucking fight. He's like, what? I can. And then that that underwear model thing, I like hung on him in the in the lines in for a little while. He was pissed. At me, but, but we worked. That was cool. But Ken, Ken, Ken was a really good guy. Ken is a really good guy. Well, Frank, Frank was a little bit of a dick. A little bit, a little bit, a little, <laughs> little bit. You know, like yeah, like I tried. Like, we were. I was always a guest at the uh, AKA. Javier treated me incredibly well and was super nice to let me use this. His, I was never directly underneath him. I never fought for him because Brian was his guy, but but um, but he was you know always really good to me. And then Frank started teaching a little bit at at, at the AKA, and I did a couple of his classes. And then all of a sudden, he announced that I was underneath him. And like I came back from my fights, and his wife was like, "Well, where's our percentage?" And I'm like, "What?" <laughs> rolled around in your school like a couple times and they want to send it to my well where's my next fight when are you getting me a fight i mean we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll talk money when you start producing something you know what i mean like so yeah we had a little bit of a going our own separate way like I, we were cool but then he you know did that money thing like come on dude you be fair about it like yeah that's, people that's... were always doing that to me people wanted a piece of me all the time that that trap fighting school the same thing the day of the fight they were like oh yeah well we were your manager so like how much are we getting i'm like I've been paying you to go to your school every time. So, I mean, I'm pretty much paid up and due, so we're good, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, man, it's, it's true. It's true. You know I mean, like, if you want to talk, huh? Oh, what Sal, about Sa right? Sabu was cool. Sabu was cool. Sabu was cool. Wow. And what you about know, funny? Go when I was, when I was getting, when I got to Missy Hyatt, they were all kind of jealous. Like, they all kind of wanted a piece of Missy. And they never got any. And I kind of walked in and went to the front of the line. <laughs> That's when she was in her payday. She was in her. Uh, she's a top. Yeah, there was a she, long line yeah. after you. That's a yeah. long line. Yeah. She, you know, man. She was. She would have still held in there strong if she got a. She got an addiction to fucking to 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 um plastic surgery. She started getting plastic surgeries. I'm like, honey, don't do this. You, you're you're fucking good. You're good for your ass and hat. You know. She started just chopping herself up. Now she looks like the Joker. You know. Yeah, that's horrible. <laughs> that's horrible. Well, you you mentioned earlier. Uh, the next Gracie guy, and this was a guy who did have a huge reputation and really, you know, looking back at it, was was an older man, didn't even belong in there probably. Joe Marrera, was he a dick though before yeah. the fight? No, Joe was a good guy. Joe was a good guy. He, 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 but he had a lot of, I mean, the, the Brazilians had a lot of confidence and, and that's part of the Brazilian thing, the machismo, man. And there's a lot of confidence there and he, he wasn't, you know, after the fight, we, we hung a little bit and it was cool. Um, but before the fight, he was, you know, very standoffish, of course, and that's kind of natural, you know. Um, but it's it's funny because everybody had him pegged as taking this thing. He was going to be the next guy. And exactly. when I got a hold of him with that first that first good shot where his, his head almost hit the ground, I hit him, he, he was flying forward. He wanted nothing more to do with me. He started backing off, backing off all the time. And people were booing. I was like, come on, dude. We got to give these people their money's worth, you know. And But um, no, but he's a good guy. He's a good guy. I mean, I, honestly, I only had the issue with Tank. Everybody else, I got to tell you, were baby faces at, 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 at heart. I mean, you know, you're going to have egos. Fighters, fighters have to have egos. Fighters have to think. We have to think we're better than each other. That's the nature of the beast. If you don't think you're better than each other, you're not. Why get in the ring? Now, let why me ask you. I, I got it. I got it. A deep, deep old. Were you on that fan? Or, or no? I think it was maybe the after. You were a little after that. But uh, did you ever meet Joe Son? Like, what was your impression of the no, Joe Son no, ball no, shot fight? No, no. What's up with that? With Keith Ed, yeah. That was, you know, that was that was like what the what was fun about the old UFC is that they these promoters thought they had control of things and they could plan what was going to happen. But you can't. Not it was a it was a witch's brew of who knows what the fuck's gonna happen, and guys are gonna go. They're not gonna follow your fucking script. And you know that whole ball shot thing with Joe. It, it's hey, you know, it's whatever works. And I'll tell you what. When I fought Kimo, I reached over and grabbed his ass by the cup and 
<laughs> so he couldn't couldn't pull me in for the fucking for the double leg. He couldn't get the double leg off me because I reached over the back end and grabbed his by the cup and rode him like a fucking all it was worth, you know. <laughs> you know you're gonna DNA do that. Got, you, DNA gonna got Joe San. I tell you well, that. It's you, funny. Oh, dude, dude, dude Joe San's a fucking huge bag. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I told you, I told you, I'm glad I never met because I think the creepy thing would have gone off with him. Yeah. He just fucking. He bought in. It's, you talk about you know the craziness of the UFC. It's like it, you, all you really need to do, to me, is analyze and watch just the first fight, which is Taylor yeah. Tuli against Gerard Gordeau. And, and Gordeau's a bad boy. Gordeau, yeah. yeah. Gordeau yeah. kicks him in the face. He loses a tooth. They're literally like, "Oh, look! I found the tooth." I mean, this is what the commentary is like. Look, the tooth is here, and it's like. You know. The ref has you know no idea if they're going to start it again. Guy in a fight? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know Yuki blinded the guy? He yeah. Thumbed, he thumbed the guy's eyes out? Fucking. That's Yuki Ooh, Nakai. That yeah, that's Yuki Nakai. That, yeah. the, but Nakai won the fight, went on, and then went on to fight Hicks and Gracie after that. So, 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 you know, so wait, wait, wait. So, Paul, so check this out. Hicks and Gracie, the greatest ever, fights yeah. a guy that weighs – Fights at 135 pounds that just got the shit beat out of him for 12 rounds yeah. with one yeah. eye, and he right. goes 10 minutes with the greatest of right. all time. Bro, you can't measure heart. You can't measure I, intent. I, I think there's some exaggeration, too, in there. In, in that well, belief. yeah, also true. And, you know, honestly, honestly, I just recently found out how much pay-for-play was going on and how much – behind the bid. Can you give us an example? Well, no, I mean, I personally, I was off, I guess I was offered things in, in hindsight, like with pancreation. I believe what Coleman says, I believe what Coleman says is true about all the things he was that was going on with Pride and, and stuff. And I mean, I wish I would have been a little smarter because Pride, I could got paid, man. They're making $100,000, $200,000. I would play. I would play for yeah, I know $200,000. Guys, I know a couple you know? of guys that, that took the dive. Well, I should say one guy that took the dive. And they stiffed him. They never paid him. Oh, oh man. I ain't gonna give a name. I gotta see this guy so Frederick had to be in there somewhere. He had to be in there somewhere. And somewhere in the line of things that that's 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 a Frederick. Uh that's why that's, 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 that's you know, that's yeah, I know he was so shady, man. So shady. I was so <laughs> I I, thought, I really I hoped have hoped he'd show for that money. I really did, because it would have been worth the seven thousand to get my hands on him for all the other money. Hey, yeah. Did you did you uh, party in Japan at all? Did you ever go oh, to uh, Roppongi? Yeah, did you go to Roppongi? Yes, man. Oh my god, I I almost got murdered at Roppongi because um I, the there was a a a um it's funny and I I didn't I only told the story eventually even though I didn't think anybody would tell me but the the kid that I saved his ass he came on and said yeah no that's this happened I was there that was me um I was we were in a in a bar in Roppongi. And this 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 uh, Holland kid, this young Holland fighter, he he knocked the beer down, spilled beer all over this this Asian guy. With, I could see the tattoos, a young guy with tattoos coming out of his arms. I'm like, oh no! And the the Holland guy didn't know to go show respect. Didn't know to go, oh sorry. And da, 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 da. He's like, oh come on, man, we're partying, I'm pushing him, and we're partying, and you know, like a young puppy. And this guy was like, you're coming with us. You're, you're coming with us. And I I. I I'm just, it happened. And so I stepped in and I said, I pushed the whole way back. I said, he's very sorry. He's with me. I apologize for him. He's stupid and young and doesn't understand what's going on. And the young guy goes, okay, you're coming with us too. And oh. I was like, oh, fuck. And I, but I wasn't, I wasn't going anywhere. I was about to fuck, do whatever it took to stay in that bar. And then, then this older guy, this old guy steps up and grabs the guy by the ear. <laughs> the guy's the guy by the ear, the, Pulls him over, fucking yells at him, and then the guy keeps comes back. And goes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and he, and he runs off the these other young guys. And the older guy comes up, goes, he waves me over to have a drink with them. And I sat down and I said, "Hey, man, I'm like, I'm scared shitless. I mean, I was right, you know, I was scared shitless, but you know, he goes, no, oh, no, he goes, he goes, those young, these youngsters, they don't understand, they don't understand, they just don't understand." And yeah. We had a drink, and and and. But that whole time, I was realizing, man, I was that close to fucking disappearing. That's a steep <laughs> learning curve. That's a like, steep learning curve. Yeah, it is a steep learning curve. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the, there's, you know, there's, there's, you know, like that thing in Russia. I mean, shit, like all those machine guns. Like, you know, you don't know where you are until you're there. You know, 
And I kind of knew, I seen the guy's tattoos, I knew how serious it was, but I was pretty drunk and I was pretty, I liked the kid and I figured I could get through it. I figured, you know, you, it's, it's how it's supposed to work is you, you apologize you, you, and you explain that, da, 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 and then that, that's how it's supposed to go. And I understood that much. And the, the, the kid actually broke protocol when, when after I apologized and he, he just kept going with it. Mm. So he got in trouble with his, well, luckily his boss was there. Yeah, and they don't like to mess that much with foreigners and stuff. It's like a different thing. So, yeah, but definitely a nice escape, man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, um, I don't know any any anything on your list still, Mike? Because I got. I think we're good, dude. That's it. That's, that's the polar bear, bro. Definitely, it's one of. The, have you done many, many? You know, since you retired and stuff, is this one of your first interviews? Because I, I like to keep track of the old guys, and I mean, I know obviously you've done some. Where, where else can you? I, did, uh, I disappeared for a while, but I've been doing a lot of podcasts recently. I actually, have you ever heard of the Caveman's Corner? I actually was a. I was a, one of the, the. I was a guest uh, host, and then I started hosting for about a year with um with on the Caveman's Corner. We had a lot of really good shows, and now I'm trying to put together my my own podcast i'd like to do a show that's basically about old timers i would also like i would also like to put together an organization to raise money for retired fighters that need money for their you know injuries after the sports over because the ufc is yeah. not going to do it the ufc is not going to do it so you know I, I would like to put together some sort of legends fund you know and and try to maybe start it up so doing you know, a podcast talking to the old timers and going through old fights with them and talk you know and, and uh something along those lines so i'm working nice. on that right now now let me I, I one final heel baby face question you ever run into yeah. dana white i uh, know well yeah yeah actually we were at um i went to with the there's an organization called legends of the cage which was kind of cooking for a while doing really good and it's kind of the guy who did it kind of got a little bit burnt out and i'm hoping he gets back to it uh brian moore really good guy likes to help people helps children helps things visit with gary goodrich and a couple other guys yeah, we went to the last the um it was UFC two eighty uh, three I want to say it was in Las Vegas and it was they had a bunch of the old timers there doing autographs and I got to meet Dana That's Way cool. got to meet yeah yeah totally I, I you know what it's funny I used to be a little bitter about how my career ended and how like the big guys got thrown under the bus and for the little guys to basically get developed and everything. But I get it. I get it now. I know it wasn't personal. It felt fucking personal because hey, I suffered from it. But it is what it is. Things changed, and um, now I'm over. I, I see all the good Dana's done for it. I also I disagree with a lot of the things that have happened. But you know what? It is huge. They're doing really good. But you know who the biggest MMA organization in the world really is? I mean, you think it was the the UFC, but it isn't. Not by far. One championship is the biggest MMA organization in the world by leaps and bounds. And if the UFC isn't careful, there, there'll be one championship coming in and taking them out because they've got the money behind it. They're huge. They're huge. Check them out. You're not familiar. You're not yeah. familiar. Take a look at the money. Oh, of course. Yeah, I was course. saying it before. Rich Franklin's the president. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there are a couple job. connections. He's got he's got uh one of his executive vice presidents, also Matt Hume, who you may remember from the old days. And uh yeah. they, they the money comes from Singapore and I will be honest with you, uh I you know, I, I haven't done any looking into money or anything like that, but I do remember when they came out, um thinking doing great. I, I, doing I, I, I and that's the thing is I remember when they came out, I was like you know, arrogant like the older guys. I was like, let's see if they got fifteen shows in it. You know, and well, it's a know, pretty good product. Got a hell of a lot more than fifteen no, shows. It's a, it's a, and I think that, product. I, I think that if somebody came in, started paying the fighters, the medium level fighters, and the guys coming up properly, so you could even get better talent going, and, and consistency, more consistency with your product, like they would nudge the UFC out right now because the UFC right now, they're kind of gluttonous. They're just eating up all the money, and they're not putting anything back into it. You know, it's a good show. The top guys are awesome, but it doesn't. It's not very deep. It's not very deep. The talent isn't very deep. The there, I, I see right now, as far as respect for what, like getting my money out of a show. Like I said, I'm looking to see women on the card. I'm looking to see what women are on the card because the guys, even if they're super talented, they're so scared to lose now. They're yeah. so scared to take a risk 
that they're not putting out a great show. They're not, they're not, they need to find a way to reinvigorate the guys to take risks and go but after it. It's all about winning, like you're saying. And that, if that means taking a guy down or outlanding him with three jabs instead of two and one, I mean, that's what it's about. You know, if you have to win, you have to win, you have to win. It's not about putting on a yeah. great show. Yeah, they have a tendency, their contracts still have a tendency to be based on an older model. They're not as much anymore, but they used to do, you know, basically 20 and 20, you know. 30-30, you know, fight, like and win, fight and win, fight and win. And and the problem with that to me is, is I, I would have done it fight, uh, you get your fight money, and then to finish the fight. If you go to the draw, you just get your fight there money. You, you know what I mean? Like, here's, here, you know, here's, the re here's the real problem, and they're taking full advantage of it, and that's what you do in the world, is the kids love the UFC so much, they want to do it so badly, they'll do anything for it. They'll starve. They'll fight for free. They'll go fucking years and years and years before they see anything out of it because that love and the desire to be a part of the best show in the world. And I'm really rooting for you for these for Bellator and these other guys to come up as quickly as possible. So they have to start taking care of their talent and developing their talent, paying for their talent. So it gets to be more like a real sport. So it's, it's more so like a real sport. And when I say real sport, I mean a real business of the sport. You know what I mean? Like the business, it's a, it's a business model that's unnatural because there's such a passion for the fighters to want to be a part of the UFC that they'll just take just about anything. Mm -hmm. Take shit. Okay. You know? At the very top, really they're doing really good. They're doing really good at the very top. But you've got to, if you want to be able to lose a fighter because of an injury or whatever and then pop, pop in a top notch guy you got to have depth you got to have like fucking 50 guys that are fucking really good and, you know, and, not 10 and, guys not 20 guys 50 guys that are all threats you know what i mean that, that are that can, you know yep and you hinted at it from you know the, even from the early days it made a difference to you when you left the trap fighting school and met other people and fought with other people oh, and stuff gosh. it, should it, have takes, been with Eric it takes money should have been with Eric pulse is where you should have yeah. been at it takes money you know, to train and to be at that level. You can't just, you know, eat McDonald's yeah. every day and, uh, you know, I run was, around the block. I was, I was lucky to be in the Bay Area fighting when I was because the Bay Area came up underneath me. People I didn't even know giving me good food, giving me training supplements, giving me, hey, come and I'll be your chiropractor. Come and help me out. I'll give you a haircut. Cool. I mean, it was, cool. oh, my God, the love, the love I got from the Bay Area was incredible. I couldn't even – I couldn't, I was just speechless. Wow, thank you. You know, it was amazing. And, and um, you know, the, the UFC is as shitty as like, hey, you can't advertise. We're going to own you. You can only have so many fights here, but you can't have your own advertising. I mean, you know what I mean? You can't advertise in there. It's only the <laughs> one Reebok fucking thing. That's some yeah. bullshit, man. These guys got to make some money. You know, these fucking kids make some money, you know? And it's, it's they're not, they're not being, they're not being fair. I mean, they, these kids are giving it up. They're getting hurt. People are getting hurt. My, but my buddy Gary Goodrich has got CTE. He mm -hmm. is, is he's, he's he's a wonderful human being, and it's 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 affecting him. And there's people out there that that have these things and these injuries. Coleman had to beg for hip surgery on online. You know what I mean? Like it ain't fucking right. Cut these, you know, okay, UFC's making as much money as the NFL now. Okay, UFC's making as much money as, as fucking basketball. Well, you know what? NFL and basketball, they take care of their retired people. They fucking take there's there's a there's a retirement fund for their for you know for you know these people. And that, that's, one thing one thing I was like wanting to see, you know, how the NB NFL, let's say if you play four seasons, uh you get a pension. I said I get right. not every UFC fighter should get one, but let's say you fought there ten times, that would equal well, maybe four years in the NFL. If you fought there ten times, you should get some form of a pension. Oh, they, I mean, that, that was my thought. I, I could see not giving it to everybody because no sport does that. But if you've been there and you're best and you help create the sport and grow it, there right. should be something. Yeah, and they can afford absolutely. that for nothing. I don't care if yeah. it's only two thousand dollars a month, something because I hate seeing fighters keep fighting. And, and right. or at least medical. Give them, give them fucking health something. insurance. Give them fucking something. health insurance. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's it's just not right. With you know, and and and. You know what I mean? When you hear, you know, hey, he's done a lot for the sport, but when you hear him bragging about how I buy a new sports car every other week or every week, it's like, fuck, come on, really? You know what I mean? You could, you know, is it really, do you really need all that? I mean, is that, yeah. is that really, is that really fucking fair? You know, like, 
it's it's you know we gotta. I, what I would like to do is is come up with a a, a, a way to, to get some money together and start investing it and start to help fighters out, and then you know shame the UFC with it. Be like, hey, you know, if you guys aren't yeah. gonna take care of the people, we're gonna take care of them. And you know, I really think once I get that together, I think the fans of MMA are so hardcore and they are so loving and they appreciate it so much that I think once there's something there to put into a fund, the money would start coming in. Yeah, so it, 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 it's something I, I really see as a possibility. I just need to get up, get a little bit more uh, move in that direction. Let, let me close out with one last name. I just remembered just uh, crazy from the old days, and he was actually Frank yeah. Shamrock's first opponent. Do you ever meet Lober, John Lober? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, John. The machine, I was, I was, he, you know, it's funny, these guys have no memories left. It's horrible. John, I was best man at his wedding. Oh, I don't even, really even remember it. And, like, like we, like, oh, yeah, me and John go way back. Yeah, the machine. Because yeah, he's, yeah. you know, because that, that's one of those old lessons, you know, with, with Frank, as you said, Frank coming over cocky from Pancras and, like, he's going to fight, he's going to fight and stuff. And he ran a Lober for his first fight, and, and Lober, you know. That was a hell of a fight. Yeah, they were he, spitting their chickles at each other. They were spitting their teeth at each other. It was that was <laughs> fucking amazing. That, Lober was that's one of those. You know, he, if, if you haven't seen if you haven't seen an old school fight, you gotta see that one. You gotta look that one up and see it because that was that was something. They were fucking going nuts. Lober Lober's crazy. Lober's yeah. crazy man. He's always been crazy. He's gotten a little bit more crazy than he should, but. But, you know, hey, whatever. That's, that's like most beat. people remember Lober as either Frank's <laughs> opponent when he beat him in, you know, in, for Frank's debut and then they rematched in UFC um, in Brazil. Um, but Lober also in Pancrase got his leg snapped in two and uh, uh, the referee and the opponent are like looking at his leg and, and he's like, Let's keep going. Let's keep going. And literally, <laughs> yeah, he's a madman. He's a madman. He's a, a monster. He's a monster. And you know that's 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 what's missing now. These yeah. guys now have become such athletes that they're the animal has kind of been bred out of them. Like there's not many of just that kind of fuck it. Let's go. Let's go. I want to fucking go. Like, like I said at the beginning, it's an athletic contest, not a fist fight anymore. You know what I mean? Right. The, the fight's out of it. It's like, I'm stronger. I can move faster, but there, there's yeah. it's not a fight for someone. You oh. know, and people want to see a fight. It's that, I don't want to see an athletic oh. contest. I don't want to you want to see a fight? Watch the ladies. The ladies are fighting. <laughs> the ladies are fighting, man. They are fucking fighting and doing it great. Like, doing it like, wow. Like, with an intensity and a power and 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 a just fuck it, we're going. And very technical too. Very technical. Yeah, very no, very super technical and unbelievable. I mean, to have that kind of conditioning, to throw like that, to take them like that, to throw like that. Holy shit! It just makes my heart warm. Like I love it. I love it. And then I go back and I see the guys and I go, wow, that's kind of embarrassing. Yeah. Well, Paul, I want to thank you a great deal, yeah. man. It's been great yeah. uh, to meet you, to catch up with you. We'll get this up here in the next couple of days and uh, spread it around. Super. And, uh, yeah, give, me the, give me the link so I can put it on the page and share it with everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We really appreciate you being on, man, being the legend like this and one of the true pioneers. I, I thought I was one. I'm not. I'm I'm, I'm I'm new guy compared to you, so thank you so much. Chris, Chris yeah, is there. We, we can I ask you one question? Can I ask you one yeah. question? Chris? Is, yeah. that, is that a morgue? Are you in a morgue? Is that where your body's going? <laughs> I'm, I'm actually I'm actually a firefighter. I'm at the firehouse. This is a locker room. Oh, <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, yeah. I was like, oh, well, cool. Thank you for being a firefighter. That's awesome. <laughs> I don't problem, man. Thank you. That's good. We, we found out today that actually Harold Howard is first generation. And then you yeah, got Paul Varland, second generation. <laughs> you got Chris, I'm like fifth. Got, coming up a couple. Of I'm like, I like to say I'm like Abe Lincoln. I'm not George Washington, but I'm like <laughs> Abe Lincoln. And uh, definitely, like it. it's been an excellent interview. Thank you very much, Paul. We'll Peace. catch up with you soon. Thank right, you. you guys have a good night. Thank you. Bye guys. 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 Have a good night. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.